All right, Jay, we are live. Thank you so much for taking the time to come on this Saturday. I know you're a busy guy. Uh, I hope a lot of the audience knows who you are, but if you could just, you know, introduce yourself real quick, your name, um, how old you are, where you're currently living, what you're currently doing, uh, and then we'll kind of get into your journey. Yeah, absolutely. My name is Jay Demerit, uh, former White Cavs, Watford, and U.S. Men's National Team player. Um, played 12 years. Uh, throughout my career, a couple different countries had the fortunate uh, uh, ability to play in a World Cup in the 2010 World Cup in South Africa. Uh, I know that's been a, a hot topic this week with World Cup qualifying, but uh, sure. yeah, I was I was one of those guys that w- that was fortunate enough to make it to the big show. But uh, what a lot of people may not know is is, is what it took to get there. Uh, you know, I, I walked over and basically with with nothing but a backpack as a 23 year old American to the English English lower divisions. I played in the 12th division, ninth division, eventually making it into the first division with Watford uh, as my kind of an introduction to the league. And then uh, we took Watford to the Premier League and then therefore the World Cup after that. So uh, I am one of the rare fl- players that uh, knows what it's like to sit on the bench in front of nobody and knows what it's like to uh, to walk out as, as one of the best players in the world at a World Cup. And so, you know, uh, my, my life actually was turned into a documentary film called Rise and Shine, which again, you know, I know you've talked about, um, but that was a Kickstarter campaign way back in 2011 where the, the passionate soccer community raised a quarter of a million dollars to tell my story and turn it into a documentary film. And so again, now I, I run uh, based off the success of, of Rise and Shine. We have a, a charity. Uh, we have a youth program called Rise and Shine Captain's Camps. Mm-hmm. We have a music festival, which is our charity, be fund, fair charity fundraiser. Uh, and now we're building an app with EA Sports, the big video game company that's going to gamify learning for young people and, and turn kind of master class type stories into in, into gamified intelligence for users and and really start to educate the next generation uh, in, in a different way that's gamified and through technology. Yeah, that that's awesome, man. I think you know your journey is is the symbol for for a lot of players and you know the podcast. Uh, I, I heard you on a podcast with my buddies on Footwork, and I listened to it a couple of times. And um, you were talking about the three pillars of your organization. And, uh, you know, when I listen to that, I always try to talk about, you know, you know, influencing the younger generation and, you know, talking to parents about how, you know, it doesn't matter if your you know, child's going to be a D1 player or they're making the A team or they're a pro football teaches you about life, the ups and the downs. And it really prepares you for, you know, later stages of your life, whether you become a pro and you make money off the game or you take what you've learned and take it into everyday life. Um, you know, what are those three pillars that you try to uh, implement within your, you know, foundation, your organization to teach, you know, younger, younger players? Mm-hmm. Uh, well, uh, the first one's belief, uh, because if you don't believe it, you, you more than likely won't do it. You know, I think a lot of people, uh, you know, we, they all believe they can, but it, usually that's, it's either a false belief or, or, or it just isn't true. Because, you know, what we've learned through many years and do I learn? you know, if you don't believe that you can do it, you probably won't. And, and, and so that needs to start with that, how you create that belief, uh, you know, how you, how you create confidence in that belief that that's a different story. That's how you work. That's what you got to work through to continue that belief system. Um, but, but, but it's got to start with that. Uh, number two is, is, uh, is respect. If you're not respecting yourself, i.e. again, respecting yourself enough to know yourself enough to know if you're making the right decisions. Exactly. Uh, you, you, have, you have to respect the person across the line from you, uh, your support systems, your parents, your coaches, the people that are outside of you. You have to respect them. Um, and lastly, and I think almost most importantly, you have to respect the, the environment that you're in. You know, as an American, I couldn't walk into the English locker rooms and pretend that I was this American dude coming in and doing my thing. You know, I had to respect that environment. I had to sit on the bench and wait. I had to be patient. I had to be quiet. I had to be humble. Uh, those are the types of things you go in when you inspect, when you respect the environment you're about to walk into. And that's a different field. That's a different job. Uh, again, that's a, it's a different environment. It's a different town. All of those things uh, present a different environment of how you should act. And, and I think, uh, I think, Respecting the environment is a is a, is a is a huge part of that respect factor, and so it's belief respect. Uh, the la- the third one is is work ethic. Um, work ethic is is doing it every day. It's it's doing yeah. it when you don't want. It's doing it when you don't want to. It's it's when you wake up and you look outside and it's raining and your body's sore and you're like, ah, I told myself I was going to go run five four days a week this week and I'm on day three and I only got one day left. Today's the day I got to go do it. You know, the work has sure. to get you out of bed and get you and get you out there and, and, and doing the work that's required. And, and, 
it, you know, it's not just saying working hard, you know, that's, that's the prerequisite to all of it. You got to work hard. You, you can't not work hard and make it um, exactly. in anything really. Uh, but, but, but the work ethic is when you're doing it when you don't want to, it's doing it when mm-hmm. you're looking outside and, uh, and, 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 and the chips are stacked against you, that ability to, to bust through that and, and get through that. That's what work ethic is. It's, it, it, it's that. And so um, once you got to work, what happens in work is, is adversity. When you do stuff, when you, well, I always say when you do shit, shit happens. And, 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 and in all honesty, that adversity piece, I think, again, almost is, is something that I come to expect instead of something that I was waiting to happen, you know, like there, there's, that's another piece of the mindset of, of, of really, um, you know, taking on adversities because they're guaranteed to be there. You know, you're going to get injured. Your friend might die. Your, your, you know, your, your mom might get cancer. Your, you might get dropped from the team and, 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 and not get a, a new contract. Like there's a bunch of ways you can create it, it, it that will happen in your life for adversity. And I think uh, the last pillar and, and this has to do in, co- in coalition with that is, is positivity. Cause when you have adversity, what gets you through that is, is that positive mindset that that silver Absolutely. lining look and to say, what can I learn from that? What did I do with that? You know, how can I take that and now turn it into a positive and, uh, and that's really the last pillar. And so, you know, first you got to believe it, then you got to respect the environment and the people around you. Then you got to actually work for it and get out of bed every day and do the work. And the last thing within that work, you got to stay positive. And, and mm-hmm. in the end, you know, we hope that at the end of, you know, applying those four, four pillars that you can, uh, you can go on and, and, and try to find your success in life. And, and again, that's broad. It's not just about sports or soccer. It's about, you know, the general, the general ability to take on a dream and take on something mm-hmm. that, that you think you can do. And most likely everybody else thinks you can't. Exactly. Exactly. No, I mean, I, I think, you know, I think the, the third pillar really, I think they all fuel each other, but I think that third pillar, really has a lot to do with that first pillar, you know, having the ability to work hard and work smart to create that belief. Um, And I think, you know, a lot of young players nowadays, I get a lot of messages from guys, you know, I trained, I I trained so well in training, I feel so good. And then I get into the games. And, you know, I just feel like, you know, my training has just gone to waste. And I just feel like I'm not there. So, you know, from your standpoint, how do you create that belief in yourself, like as a younger player? Uh, if they're, you know, uh, kids, you know, seven, eight, nine years old who have the dream of becoming a pro, um, how do you create that belief within yourself? Uh, well, what I speak on a lot now is, uh, is this whole piece on kind of, it's called self-leadership is kind of the title of what it, what it means. And it's kind of like, you know, the way that my story always resonates with people is that I, um, I actually just spoke at the big coaches conference, the United Soccer Coaches Conference down in mm-hmm. Kansas City, and I got asked to come down there and speak based on the on the fact of, of, of the self leadership piece, and that's you know how how you take it upon your own story to lead yourself. You know, we're always looking to coaches, we're looking to our parents, our peers, exactly. groups, and things exactly. to help us to help us lead and say, well, what should I do? And in a way, like if you if you can create self leadership in your life you need those people and those things for support. You don't need them to make your own decisions. Yes. And I think we, I think if, if, if you create self-leadership in yourself, you know, all those extra things are bonus land. And those are things that are there to support you. But technically, if you create a mindset that you can support yourself, then you give yourself the best opportunity to go and succeed. And, and so Absolutely. self-leadership is, is, is essentially a couple of different things. It's, it's the first thing is, is, is intention. You have to know why you're there. Do you want to make the team just to play varsity? Do you want to get a contract to play division three? Do you want to play, uh, you know, NAIA? Do you want to get a university scholarship and go to school? Again, all different intentions, but first as you come into the game and again, those intentions can always, can always change too. If you get to the level that you want and then you can always change things. But the first way to enter the room is just with the intention of what you want to do and what you want to get out of it. And Mm -hmm. so once that's set, um, then you, then you have to start to create awareness awareness for yourself and awareness for yourself is, is, is actually going into your mind. See, what do I like about this? What am I good at? What skills do I bring to the table and really start to create the awareness piece of, yes, I'm, I know, I know why I'm here, but now what am I entering the room with? What skills do I have? What am I bringing to this table? And again, it could be good things, bad things. I know that if I run too much in the first 15 minutes, I'm going to get really tired for the rest of the second half. If I know mm-hmm. that about myself, because I've done that and I realize it about myself, maybe I won't come out with guns blazing for the first 15 minutes. But if I'm not mm-hmm. aware that that's what's happening, then the rest of the 30, 30 minutes of that half are going to be crappy for me. <laughs> but if I'm now to walking out in that game and I know that maybe my body gets tired right away, but then I find the fitness later, 
maybe I'll go out with a little bit more intention of I'm going to ease into the game. So by 30 minutes, I'm hitting, I'm hitting the ground running. And so that kind of awareness piece of, of, of the type of player you are and what you bring to the table is this next piece. From there, now you start to practice what it is that you're good at and bad at. So this is where you start to go into, you know, the confidence piece. Because if you have intention and then you have awareness, what that creates now is confidence because you're starting to understand what you, you bring to the field. And so if, I, if I'm someone that, um, you know, is good at my right, at my right foot and not very good at my left, I'm not going to use my left as much, but I'm going to train on my left when no one's around. I'm going to train on that mm-hmm. thing when, 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 so I, next time I come in, because I'm aware I'm not. I'm not good on my left. I'm going to train on that. But then when I'm in the game, I'm going to use my right. Cause that's when I Absolutely. can use my skills and gain confidence as me as a player. So, you know, intention locks awareness, awareness unlocks confidence, confidence now unlocks belief. And so once you have confidence, now you're training in those moments and you're gaining confidence because you're now becoming the player you want to be. Now exactly. you have the belief. Exactly. Now you have the, now you have the last piece, which is the belief. And so now you believe now you're back to step one. If I believe it, I can do it. And so it, it's kind of like this thing that really unlocks itself with, within the self, self-leadership piece. And then once you actually are this player that knows who they are, knows what they're good at, knows what they need to work on and believes in themselves, now you can go out to the rest of the world and be a good teammate. Now you can go out For to sure. the coach and say, and say, yo, coach, like, what else do I need to do? Uh, hey, player, hey, mom, what would you think about my performance? All of that stuff is relevant once you understand yourself enough to not let those other pieces really influence you as much because you you drive from self Mm -hmm. absolutely even though mom always thinks you play well you know (laughs) well yeah which helps which helps build confidence (laughs) for sure for sure but yeah i mean just like you said i mean the um that self-analysis piece is huge you know and i think it takes a lot within yourself to be able to properly self-analyze and i think um you know one thing that i really get a lot from you is like you know not looking at anything, like you said, the fourth pillar of positivity, not looking at anything as a negative, but something to learn from. So like you said there, you know, you, you know, you're just getting experience as a player. Uh, you think like you need to go 110% first 15 minutes, you get tired and you reanalyze, you know, you try to pace yourself and you make better decisions. And like you said, I think it's huge, like to rely on those strengths and to be able to use th- those because, Obviously, as we both know, that's what's going to make you, you know, stand out as a player. And then, you know, in the dark, you're working on, you know, you're working on uh, your weaknesses and, and trying to make them, you know, level up to your strengths or even better. Um, but, yeah, I mean, I, I think that's, you know, that's crucial in, in overall development. And we always hear these cliche sayings of, you know, uh, you know, work hard in the dark, take yourself out of your comfort zone. But they are cliche sayings because they work. And then I think until you actually put yourself in that zone, you know, like you did going over to England at 23, Mm -hmm. buying a one-way plane ticket, starting in the ninth league. Until you put yourself in those uncomfortable situations, you're not going to, you know, you can't read about, yeah, you can read about how to adapt to problems and things like that. But when you're in that, in that environment and you have to always perform no matter what and, and sure that you're ready that's when you really, you know, develop yourself as a player and a person. A hundred percent. And and you're right. Like putting yourself in these environments is really the only way you're going to learn in the first place. And so, you know, a lot of people will talk about it or they'll sit on the fence and never actually make the decision to go for it. And I, and I think exactly. that's the first step is, is just actually making the decision to put yourself in the arena to fail. You know, in all honesty, you know, you always have to go into arenas thinking, you know, I'm not, I'm not here to lose, but I might. And that's okay because I'm going to learn mm-hmm. something. And so, mm-hmm. so if that's the that if that's the attitude, again, you're never going to fail in the first place because you're going to learn something. And so, exactly. you know, I think that's that's one of the cliches too. But it's actually true in practice. You know, and and, and I, you know, I went to school for design, and so I have a degree in industrial design, which is product design. And so, if you take, mm-hmm. you know, I always use this like if you take a phone, right? This is a product. Somebody designed yeah. this, right? They had to they yeah. had to design this camera. They had to change the buttons. They had to just, they, they figured out that if you put this thing on the back, you know, you can, you can hold it and you don't lose mm-hmm. your mm-hmm. phone. Uh, mm-hmm. You can see that if you add another camera, now I can take something up close. I can flip it around and actually use the one in the front. This product was designed over many, many years, right? One day they just said, Hey, can we put technology in a handheld device? Exactly. And then one day the next, the next dude came up and said, Hey, check out, let's put a camera on the front. And the next girl came up and said, no, we need to put the volume, the volume on the side because it's easier to use. 
And so what I learned in product design school as a metaphor of life is that if you, if you are a product, you, mm -hmm. I'm a product. I love it. I'm yeah. about to put myself into a world that, you know, understands product, but maybe I have my own buttons. Maybe my button should be over here. Maybe, maybe I don't like this that high and I should move it down because my hand's bigger and I put it down here. And so this is kind of a metaphor for the individuality we all bring to the table as, a, as our own products, but we have to pay attention to where our buttons are. We have to, and if we don't like them, move them. You know, we have the, we have the ability as designers of our own lives to be able yes. to, to move our buttons and, and to do things that make our stories better or our stories, you know, more complete because we've actually, again, going back to the awareness piece, paid attention to why I asked questions after a game. I said, should my button be here? Mm -hmm, Does, mm -hmm. Is this, is this comfortable for me? Am mm -hmm. I, am I always getting the ball on my right side, but I'm left footed? Like you should be aware of that stuff. You should ask those questions. If it went right, why, if it went wrong, why? And so that's the feedback loop we should always be in. Sure. And to your well, point, if, if you do, if you do feedback with a positive mindset, then again, the next time you go out there, you're going to have a better knowledge for it. You'll have learned something. And technically, if you practice in that new mind, then you're going to be better off for it too. And so that's kind of the process of, of that, that creative process of like always learning, always looking, and then always wondering, does it apply to me? Because if it doesn't, then we're just learning and looking and we're not actually applying. And that's, that's the big difference of how we get better faster. You know, and, mm -hmm. and you, you've seen this a lot and a lot of coaches will tell you the same thing. You know, they don't like it when the guy makes the fourth mistake for the fourth day in a row, because it means mm -hmm. he's not listening. It means you're not exactly. taking that on. And so, you know, if, if all of a sudden you, you play the same forward for three games in a row, he keeps doing the same things after all three games. And you're like, no, this is what I want you to do. You know, coaches won't play you on the fourth game. And then you're wondering, exactly. why didn't you coach play me, man? Like, I didn't even get to play because it was – and I was like, no, because you did something wrong three games in a row when you got asked to not. And, exactly. and that's just not – that's just not listening. That's not going to a feedback loop that actually is is you taking your personality away and wondering what you as the product needs to get better and improve on. And there's humility mm -hmm. built into that code. There's humility built into looking at yourself through a focal lens that says, I'm going to be good either way but I'm going to take that criticism on board and actually apply it in a way that, that again, that, that I'm attracted to, or that one that fits my mold as a product. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I absolutely love that because I, I, I actually use that same exact frame. Like if you think of your career as a business, you are your own asset. Just like you said, you are your own product. So you have to look at ways, you know, if we're talking about, you know, if, if the team is the consumer and you are the product, how can you make yourself better to help that team? You know, how can you make yourself the better product? Can you self-analyze yourself? You know, how are you physically, technically, tactically, mentally? How can you, you know, adjust those buttons, toggle those, those buttons to help that team? And as mm -hmm. we both know, you know, every coach has their own style of play, which makes the game so beautiful. So you can fit into different systems and how can you toggle your ability to be the best asset to that team. So no, I absolutely love that. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Can you, so like for those who didn't see the documentary, can you take us through your journey, you know, real quick, you know, I know you, you grew up in green Bay, right? That's right. Yep. Yeah. If you could take us through your, your development where you played college and then, you know, when you made that decision to go overseas. Yeah, so I, I I grew up in Green Bay, Wisconsin. I, I I was a three sport athlete. I came back from the from the the multiverse of sports. Uh, again, Green Bay not being uh, a soccer hotbed <laughs> in American soccer. You know, we have an American football team called the Green Bay Packers, and that's all sure. we really care about. And that's all I really cared about when I was a youngster. So I wanted to be Brett Favre. Um, and I had a I, I, but I did have a I had a cathedral, uh, eighty thousand seats cathedral outside of my house. So. I always just had this lore of stadiums, you know, like mm -hmm, I always, mm -hmm. I always loved stadiums and having them be in the background and wondering if you could ever get in playing one and stay in one and watch games in one. So I kind of loved that about growing up in Green Bay. Uh, again, it's a blue collar town. So, you know, genuine work ethic, you know, mm -hmm, you got to mm -hmm. work hard in those places. Sure. It's not, it's not, you know, it, it, it's, it's factory workers. It's people that care about their hard earned football team. And, and, uh, but they truly ask you how you are. They genuinely care about you. And, yes. and, and I think that that as a core of where I could grow up, I couldn't have asked for a better place or a better support system for my family and, and the support that I've, I've gotten my whole mm -hmm. life. But, you know, I was 18. I, I had a, a D3 basketball scholarship and a D1 soccer scholarship. I only got mm -hmm. one offer. 
uh, to UIC, which is in the uh, mm -hmm. Horizon League. I think they're changing now this year. Um, but it's a small Division One school, south, south loop of downtown Chicago. And literally, it was because my high school coach uh, used to used to coach University of Wisconsin Green Bay. So mm -hmm. he knew the small D1 kind of loop. And so he called the coach. And after my high school was over, he's like, hey, I got a kid up here. Like, I think you should take a chance on him. Like, yeah. He's a good athlete. He's green yeah. behind his ears. But he's willing he's he's where he works hard he's got a good work ethic and uh, you take you should take a chance on him and so just like we all do we all need to take our chances when we get them exactly. we never know where they're going to come from if we don't ask or if people that support us don't help us and again all of those are valid you can help yourself you can make your own chance you can actually mm -hmm. go hey i know you know this coach if you appreciate my game can you ask if they got any spots left for their for their roster next year yeah, like, that. that's not a bad question to ask. And again, you have to rely on somebody else to do that. But if they trust you and they know you, they probably will help you. But again, mm -hmm. if you don't ask, if you don't ask, you don't get. And and I think, exactly. I mean, I didn't, I didn't ask my coach to do that, but he took it upon himself because I had shown him enough on my day to day training that I could, that he would take a chance on me. And so that's what happened. And I got, a, I got a small scholarship. I was paying, I was paying seven thousand dollars a year to go to school at uic mm -hmm. for my first two semesters because i came in on basically a walk-on scholarship at two thousand dollars a semester two or three thousand mm -hmm. a semester and i had to pay out of state tuition because i was from wisconsin mm -hmm. and so i had to pay for university my first year by, by the end of my first year uh, a lot of as the story goes i came in as a forward uh, i'd never played defender before and in our first preseason tournament down in jacksonville florida we lost a defender to a red card and went to an injury and so there we are. I'm about to get redshirted. Literally, my coach was like, oh, well, you, you know, you're coming in a little bit behind the eight ball. Um, I think we're going to redshirt you this year. So I, I come off the bench the first game on up front. And uh, off the second game, I, he comes up to me. He's like, hey, have you, ever, have you ever thought about playing defender before? And then you're like, it's kind of an ego hit when you like, you could just get redshirted sure, as a sure. forward. And you're like trying to score. And, you know, because that's what I knew on a soccer mm -hmm. field. And uh, then somebody asks you to go to the other end of the field. And <laughs> in, in a way, um, again, because I was a freshman and because I, again, I was aware that I wasn't that good. Mm -hmm. I was aware mm -hmm. that I had good attributes. I was aware I was a good athlete. I was aware I was a good competitor. Uh, I, I, but I was aware that I wasn't, I, I wasn't a, a touted all American high school player out of Chicago. And I was playing against mm -hmm. those guys now and with those mm -hmm. guys, because all the best mm -hmm. players in Chicago came to UIC because that's where they recruit from because it's a big city and metropolitan area, really good mm -hmm. soccer standard in Chicago because there's so many kids. Mm -hmm. and so I'm playing against all these guys and I'm like, you know what? Like, you know what coach? Like if that's what you see in me, then sure. You know, we played a marking back system. So it wasn't as tactical as, as mm. defensive, you know, tactics may be. It was, Hey, take that guy. He's a good athlete. Take that forward and mark him. And I thankfully in basketball, and this is why I, I appreciated my, my background of multi sports was exactly. that when I was on a basketball court, my job on the basketball court was to mark the scoring forward. And so I knew how to mark up somebody. I knew how to chase somebody around in a box and, 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 and disrupt them. Mm -hmm. And so I kind of took that into, again, my awareness to go, okay, why not? I mean, it's a, it's going to get me on the field. And I'm exactly. pissed off. I'm pissed off. I'm, I might even use, lose a year of eligibility by not being on the field because I'm trying to be something that maybe I'm not because my coach who knows players might see something in me. Mm -hmm. So again, if you, if you can peel back the ego layer a little bit and you can go, well, he's asking me to start good. He's asking me to start in a position that's not mine. Okay. He's asking me to, 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 to play with, with a bunch of players that he trusts already. Okay, great. For me, that was an opportunity, whether it was the opportunity that I, that I dreamed my whole life to be in. No, that wasn't it. But that opportunity alone changed my changed my course for the better. And if it was only because I said yes, if I would have said, no, coach, I'm a forward, I'll sit on the bench, and I'm going to show you that I can score goals, that might have worked too. But I got to be honest, like what, by, by saying yes and by being open to his suggestions that he might see something that I don't, mm. I learned in, in three games for the rest of that preseason tournament, and I say this all the time, I learned in three games that I had been playing out of position for 19 years. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Unbelievable. Unbelievable. No, yeah. I mean, just like you said, like, uh, I think, you know, one thing I actually did learn uh, from my small town in the U.S. was, you know, when a coach asks you what position you play, you, you know, cliche, you say whatever position you want me to play. And just like you said, I think the most important thing is to be able to get onto the field. And once you're on the field, you could show your ability. Um, mm -hmm. But also what, what I what 
is very interesting and obviously it's coming up in the conversations now in the U.S. with football growing a lot. Um, do you think that the early specialization in you know soccer slash football is going to kind of hurt athletic development for footballers, U.S. footballers in the future? Um, well, I, you know, again, my, my solution to bringing multi-sport back into like your siloed approach to youth development here in North America is by adding the programs and sport training into the program itself. So it's not like you're, you're taking your 14 year old residency program kids and bringing them into a basketball program that's in the same town down the street. Like I understand that the programs and the institutions are built now. So it's hard to, hard to build a silo next to a silo. It's, exactly. it's almost impossible. But if you bring the other sport into the silo and you start saying, Hey, we're going to start playing basketball as a team on mm. Tuesdays. Exactly. And again, I'm talking young. I'm not talking about, you know, 18, 17, 16, 15 year olds. I'm talking about mm. development. Development exactly. is in my opinion, that starts at six and goes to 13. Exactly. That, that, those are my development years. And I think at mm-hmm. 14, 15, you can have a much more knowledgeable approach to where you want to go sure. uh, when you're 14, 15, 16, 17. And so, and, it, and again, you don't have to play basketball, but you can come in and you can, you can teach the fundamentals of another sport. You can, because um, each of them has a different, like I always talk about multi-sport as saying like basketball, I learned not only, first you got to play with four others. So that's a different team dynamic. It's a different social environment. If yes. I'm running track, which I did, or I'm playing golf or I'm playing tennis, that's me versus me and me versus one other person. That's mm-hmm. going to give me a different social skill and it's going to give me a different athletic skill and a different mindset skill. Um, and if it's track, it's the same. But I'm running in the same race one time for one lap with against a bunch of people. That's a different mm-hmm. mindset. That's a different, that's mm-hmm. a different kind of competition. Um, and then, if you, you know, again, if it's hockey, it's the same as basketball. You're four others. It's a fast pick game. There's subs all the time. But in soccer you know, you're 10 people on your team with no stoppages with 10 people on the other team. So think about that from a social environment. Think about that from a communication level. Think about that from on a bunch of different levels. Now you give all that experience to someone that's six to 12 and 15, you got yourself a, a high performance thinker athlete that now is going to go transfer into something that can transfer when it really matters at 17, 18, 19, when I, when I truly am going to get picked. And I understand exactly. that like, there's going to be some changes within that system. There's going to be some changes within like your traditional systems of how you could bring that, that whole kind of concept into a team or a, or a high performance sport environment. But why, why not? Mm-hmm. You know, mm-hmm. I, I don't, I think that all those things I just talked about can help a player as much as having that same player only play soccer and only hit the ball against the wall and go out and do more drills and go out and do more fitness and go out and do all these things all related to one sport. I get it, but, I think that the other one will create a more well-rounded person and athlete 100%. and mentality. And I say mentality as the most important because, you know, I always look at my experience of why I was able to do what I did coming from behind the eight ball and actually being really late to the party. You know, like I didn't mm-hmm. turn pro till I was 23. Mm-hmm. I didn't play soccer mm-hmm. on a full-time level till I was 19. Well, why did I hit the ground running? Why did I make the teams? Is, I guarantee you is because I had other skill sets that a lot of these other footballers that had only played soccer their whole lives had. And I know that because I've asked that. And I also know that because I, I, I'm aware. Mm-hmm, <laughs> and mm-hmm, I can absolutely. See, I, I, can, I can see why it worked and see why it didn't. And I know that that worked for me. I, it, it helped me get picked as, as, as when I was standing in line with everybody else. Absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, I think, you know, based on your story, just that competitive edge you have, you know, the work ethic, the persistence, it just really, you know, being able to know how to win is, is huge, you know, and compete. You know, uh, so, yeah, so, no, how did, and, so how did and, the rest of I that, think... sorry, what were you saying? Well, the rest, the rest, the rest went out. No, it's all good. Um, and so as I, as I came out of university, I'd, I'd kind of earned my right to, I was an honorable mention all America and all American. So I wasn't like getting picked, but I was being told that I was pretty good. That, that was kind of the, the what I got out of my university career. Again, like I wasn't part of the, the, the scouting networks. I wasn't part of, you know, I got to play in two NCAA tournaments. I, I, uh, we got to play out in Stanford. You know, we, we finished 25th in the nation that year. My, that was my sophomore year. Um, and no, I was sorry, my junior year. And so my senior year, our good senior class had left. And so we, we didn't, we didn't make the tournament my last year, but I had been playing PDL, you know, obviously USL two basically mm-hmm. is what that would transfer to right now. 
And again, I still felt like I had so much to learn. I still felt like I was still new to the game and, um, but having good results, you know, playing, Mm -hmm. playing against players that were in the MLS, playing against guys that did get drafted and having a good games against them. And so again, in my mind, I was like, okay, I think I'm good enough to make it. I just, I Mm -hmm. haven't had the, I haven't had really the blueprint to, to, to kind of be on the page of a scout or someone that's going to pick me because a, I don't go to a huge school that's because again, back then, and I'd say it's different now because it is, you know, there's a bigger net mm. now there's, there's USL one, there's USL two, there's PDL teams, there's, there's reserve teams of teams that are all, you know, there's now there's how many MLS teams, 25 or 20, something like that. Mm-hmm. So, you know, the net is much bigger now. So it's hard to, hard to compare it to what my story was then back in 2002. So you're talking 20 years ago now. Mm-hmm. Um, but uh, the same thing, applies is that I didn't get picked <laughs> and so mm-hmm. and so when you don't get picked you got again you got to go back in and take it upon yourself to figure out why and then you got to figure out if you do still want to get picked and again I say that with you know sometimes you don't get picked and you're like okay that's enough for me I don't I don't want it anymore but for me it was mm-hmm. like I still wanted it mm-hmm. because they didn't know my story they're not looking at me because I'm not on the sheet I haven't been on that sheet for 20 years like everybody else and played for you know San Diego surf and like played in all the big tournaments and was getting recruited mm-hmm. out of college to all these big schools. Like mm-hmm. I didn't have that journey. That wasn't, that wasn't my journey. That wasn't my, that wasn't my story. And so, you know, I took it upon my, my own story and I was like, okay, I'm going to, I got an opportunity to play USL two for a team called the Milwaukee rampage, or mm-hmm. I had an opportunity. My, my friend who is English was going back to London to live with his mom. And he's like, you can come live in my attic. It will be awesome. You know, you can, you can come check out the, you can check out the lower divisions and see what that's like. Yeah. And so either way, I, you know, I, again, I just graduated university and so I had a degree. So I always knew that like in design, I, if I can, if I, if I go there to England and fail, if I go to Europe and I start trying for teams and I either get hit in the face and like, no, this is way too big for you. Or I go there and I give a good shot and they, they tell me I'm not good enough. Then probably I got both sides of the border telling me I'm not good enough yeah, then maybe they're right. And that's okay mm-hmm. too. And that's mm-hmm. why I went to school. And that's why I got a degree because I knew that I could fall back on these things that, that, you know, that reality of life gives us. And so mm. that was my mindset moving in England. You know, I had a backpack and a pair of cleats and that's all I had. Exactly. I had saved exactly. up about, you know, 1800 bucks working at a bar and bartending and working at a restaurant. And, uh, and so I, I kind of landed on English shores and, and really with my open eyes, just wanted to learn, wanted to put myself in the environment as much as I could. And so I was training at AstroTurfs, you know, three days a week. I was, I was playing on a 12th division team for 40 bucks. Um, I'd get a little cash envelope uh, after every game and that and that basically bought my food for the week. Mm-hmm. Uh, again, I was, I was fortunate enough with my opportunity where I didn't have to pay rent. I was living at someone else's house. Um, and uh, yeah, I was sleeping on a mattress on an attic floor, you know, we'd rolled it up through this hole in the ceiling and we'd climb up through this metal ladder and I'd sleep on the, and I'd sleep on the floor and I, and I, and I did it for a year. Um, wow. But, but I, what I always say is like, if you are paying attention to your story, you can see if you're progressing or not. Exactly. And, and so, but by the end of that season, you know, I had, I had played against really good players that always had good feedback for me. I had played with guys that were ex pros up to the first division. And every one of them said, you know, keep going. Like you got a lot better this year. You know, that mm-hmm. feedback was really good. Again, guys that had been there, guys that had seen the lights, guys that had played in front of, you know, thousands of people and played for their national teams. They were playing now as 36 year olds in the lower leagues. That's what mm-hmm. happens mm-hmm. in England. You know, but you get to 36, you can pick up four or 500 bucks a game just by playing in the 10th division, ninth mm-hmm. division. So that they show up on Saturdays, they play one game, they get their 500 bucks, have a few beers and leave. But mm-hmm. that's like fun for them because that's built into the culture of the fabric of England or in a lot of the European, yeah. you know, European places. Yep. So those guys, um, and I'm asking them questions. I'm going, seriously, you think I can make it? They'd be like, dude, like if you keep going, you know, you're young, you're hungry. You, this is what you can do. And thankfully, you know, my game suited the English game. You know, I was a good competitor. I was a good athlete. I, I, I like to kind of wear my heart on my sleeve. English people like that kind of player. They like mm-hmm. someone that gets stuck in. They like people that don't complain. Like that was kind of my mold as a player really fit. The English mold is what they what they wanted to look for, and so by the end of that first season, I had two third division tryouts. Mm. And so again, I'm not I'm not looking uh, at the end of that season. I, I had I had um, one that went to Oxford United, which I drove three hours one way, used all my money to get up there, and they put me in the 87th minute <laughs> and said, "Oh, oh, thanks for coming." 
you know, we'll call you. <laughs> and they never yeah, called because I, yeah. I got three minutes. You know what I mean? And so that positivity piece, it's going back to what we talked about earlier. I could look at that as my adversity. Be like, oh, man, I had my shot and I missed. Oh, man. But I could also look at it as this, this opportunity to say, I've just hopped six divisions in one exactly. season. And I got this tryout. That is positivity and silver lining at its finest when you look at a situation and say, can I look at this as a shitty situation or do I look at this as an opportunity to get better? And that was like, whoa, I jumped six, six divisions. I'm getting, in fact, I'm getting mm-hmm. third division tryouts. I'm coming back next year. And so I went yeah. back to Chicago that first off season. I worked, I worked again and, and, and worked going back to jobs, making some more money so I could, I could afford my ticket back. And so mm-hmm. but when I did, Again, my coach had, had, had moved to a, a different uh, lower league team that was playing against Watford in a friendly. And he's like, I know you came off those, 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 um, those trials at the end of the season. Come do preseason with us and you can play against Watford. And so Watford, again, his timing would have it and, and his serendipity would have it. They didn't have, they'd come down from the Premier League, so they didn't have a lot of money. Uh, they were trying to offload a bunch of their high earners, so they didn't have any big money to bring anybody in. And they had three center backs that were all over 34 years old. And so they needed some younger blood, uh, you know, with these older heads. And and so I became that. And I played against them and they needed, they needed a free, a free player that was like me. And, and again, and, and that's where I believe when you put yourself in the right situation, situations are, are right for you. And, and, and I, and I think that's what happened to me is that I got put in that situation to succeed and, and I, and I took it upon myself to do so. And, and so I played well, I was ready for that game. I knew that was a game that people could be watching. So I didn't come in unfit. I didn't, didn't come in not sharp. You know, I had a whole preseason for me to get ready, both, mm-hmm. both physically and mentally to get ready for that moment. And, mm-hmm. you know, when, when I go in with purpose and, and that never changed for the rest of my career and still not like, you know, when you're ready for situations because you've thought about them, you've prepared for them. And then when they happen, you're ready for them. You know, it's amazing how, how life can progress the way you want it to. And that's what mm-hmm. happened. I got my contract. They took me. They took me on trial for another two weeks. Uh, I got to play in a couple reserve games, and then famously, as the story goes, I I got called to the stadium for their last game against Real Zaragoza. It was a Spanish La Liga team coming to town uh, with the first team at Vicarage Road, the big stadium. And he called me in. And he says, "Oh, I want you to come get involved." So I'm thinking I'll get a minute, maybe get to warm up with the team because I didn't even I hadn't even trained with the first team yet. And, mm-hmm. and I came into the, to the locker room that day, and I, my name was in the starting lineup with ten starters on the first team mm-hmm. that I had never even I'd never even trained with, let alone played with in front of thirty thousand people at Watford. So mm-hmm. it was uh, it was that was one of my big moments of like, do you sink or do you swim? Mm-hmm. And uh, I had a really interesting conversation with myself first. I went to the bathroom stall because I was freaking out because he didn't tell me. And he was a lot of times the English managers, they don't even come into the locker room before the game. They, they meet you outside the tunnel and because they let the players do the things. Maybe they'll come in and say what's up, but he didn't, I didn't even see him before I really went out there. And so I couldn't talk to him. He didn't want to talk to me because I think, you know, he, that's what he wanted to do. He was, this was a full on challenge to be like, okay, I'm going to put him in there, see how he reacts. I'm going to see mm-hmm. how he can perform. And I went out there and did what I needed to do again in those big moments where I knew I was maybe were a little bit out of my sorts. Um, I just stick to my, to what, to my guns and knowing what I, well, knowing what my guns look like and knowing what ones I can use. And so that's kind of what I do. I try not to get out of my comfort zone too much. I know what I'm good at. So I stick to that. I, I'm not mm-hmm. trying to hit left footed left footed bombs up because like, that's going in the stands and then all these English fans are like, Oh, who's this guy? Yeah, you know, yeah, you know yeah. what I mean? Trying trying too hard. You know what I mean? It's like win the ball, yeah, give yeah. it to somebody else. Win the ball, exactly. win the win that ball in the air, give it to somebody else. Mark mm-hmm. your man on corners and don't give it up. Mark mark your man on corners and make it hard for him. You know mm-hmm. what I mean? Win tackles, you know, be physical, be fast, use your athleticism, you know what I mean? Pull up against people, be strong and be confident. Cool. I can do Absolutely. that. I know I can do that because mm-hmm. I've done that hundreds of times, hundreds of times before. Like, yes, mm-hmm. you can you can move into the factors of stadiums and noise and pressure and all the other things, but pressure comes off when you know what you're good at and you know and you, and you take confidence in your skill sets. And that was one thing I always I always did. I, I knew I knew what I was good at. I knew what I brought to that field every time. And as you get better, you bring more. That's what you mm-hmm. want. Absolutely. But even even if even if you have a, a, a small skill set, you still know what you have. And, mm-hmm. and so. I just, in those beginning years, I really just stayed in my lane 
listened to the good players around me meant that got mentored by a lot of the good center backs those 34 year olds I was playing next to my first my first two seasons really helped me they helped me read the game they helped mm. me understand the game in a different level they helped me understand how to use my voice I commun- communicate on the field uh, communicate runners across all that kind of stuff they, they were really on me a lot about that mm. kind of thing because they knew that those are the pieces that I didn't have as, mm. a, as a 20 23 year old rookie and mm-hmm. so they, they helped me that that's where the mentorship level comes in, you know, in the game um, or in life, you know, finding mentors, finding people that can help teach you things that you don't know. Um, mm-hmm. So I use those first couple seasons to do that. Um, and then my second year, we got promoted to the, to the Premier League and I scored the goal that got us promoted in, in front right. of 76,000 people um, in Cardiff, Wales. And uh, before I knew it in year three, I was a Premier League soccer player and no one wow. in America had even had ever heard of me. Yeah. Unbelievable. And what what was that feeling like after scoring that header? Well, it was only in the 20, 20, 27th minute, so I had a lot of playing to do still. So I, I yeah. tried not to get get, in my, get ahead of myself. But, you know, I, you enjoy those moments because, you know, Absolutely. that was a time where my family, my family was in the stands. A lot of those, wow. um, a lot of those players that I played with in the non-league days, my coaches that kind of helped me on my journey, they were all there. And so mm-hmm. to, to enjoy that moment with them and, and to, to really – you know, make the most of those moments was, was great. And then right off the field, you're going to be a Premier League player. You got champagne, but then you start to hit that pressure. Like, oh my God, like I'm going to be playing against, you know, Manchester United next, you know, next yep. year and all of these things. And so with that comes pressure. With that comes That's calls cool. from the media and the media is like, oh, well, you know, what's it going to be like? And you're like, oh God, I got to go do that now. Okay. Yeah. Nah, I got to yeah. get back. To, I got to get, I got to get back to work. And so, you know, I, I, I reset new goals as a Premier League player. I wanted to be in the mind of my national team. You know, I didn't at the time of then, I didn't know if I'd ever play for my national team, but mm-hmm. you know, now you're a Premier League player and you're a starter on your, on your first division team. And, and, and now in the Premier League, you know, you better believe you can make it now. And so I, I shifted mm-hmm. some goals then. Um, but again, I'm not making the national team if I don't play well for Watford. And so that was kind of my goal. Start every game, be a, be a starter this year. And then that'll open up the window to, to mm, the national mm. team. And that's what happened. I, I, I had probably my best season, our premiership, premiership season. Um, <clears throat> I took second in our, in our uh, player of the year for that team that wow. year in, in my premiership season, we lost out to Ben Foster, who's still playing for Watford right now. <laughs> yeah, yeah, <laughs> and so yeah, he, yeah. he was, he was on loan for Manchester United at the time. And so he won player of the year that year in, Prem, in the Premier League. We had a, we were wow. busy. We were busy at the back in our Premier mm-hmm. League season, and yeah. so him and I got a, him and I got a lot of accolades for that year. But uh, uh, it wasn't easy playing against the best players in the world. But for me, it was it was a learning experience about consistency, because yes. you know when you play against the best players in the world, sometimes they'd like Chelsea comes to town, and you get to play against this player, and you're like, great, I got to do that. But mm-hmm. then next week, Arsenal comes to town. And then the next week, Manchester United comes to town. And then the next week, Man City comes to town. And then the next week, this player comes to town. And so you never get a day off to mm-hmm. playing against the best standard in the world. Like you don't. And again, that comes with pressure of the stadiums. That comes with the with the with all the things that come with it. And so I really looked at the, that time as my kind of learning about how to do it every day. That consistency piece of, for sure. yeah, you can do it once. But when you got to do it for 40 games in a row throughout a whole season, against the best players in the world in the biggest stadiums in the world, you know, that's what got me prepared for the national team. Mm. Because when I, when I started to walk into the national team setup, I had that confidence because I had done it for my club. I was captain of my club. So I didn't have to wait in the wings of the national team. Like I had to wait for all of the other teams I was playing on or I had earned the right to be at. And so I think again, when I was, when I walked into the national team, I was able to carry a little bit more confidence. I didn't feel like a new player. Even though mm-hmm. my colors and the colors on my jersey were different, mm-hmm. you know, I was I was playing against Tim Howard every week. I was playing against Clint Dempsey. I was playing against, uh, you know, Carlos Bocanegra. I was playing against, you know, Casey Keller and Brian McBride and and and, mm-hmm. and, and Brad Friedel. And I got to score on Brad Friedel as well. And so, like, these are the American icons that I grew up, sure. you know, looking at and watching these guys. But then all of a sudden, I'm playing on the on, on the op- opposition against them. And so then all of a sudden, I'm gaining confidence to know that, you know, three months later, I get called in from Bob Bradley. And I'm I'm now sitting with Carlos Bocanegra, Tim Howard, Steve Trundolo, Stu Holden. These are guys I get to fly with. That I play against them now. So we kind of know each other. Mm-hmm. And now they respect mm-hmm. me. They respect me already because I play against them. They know that I'm good mm-hmm. enough because they're playing against mm-hmm. me in the biggest league in the world. And so I kind of was able to uh, use that to my advantage. 
you know, I, had, I was a leader on the team at Watford. I was captain of the team by my third season. So it was, it was one of those things that, you know, I didn't have to thankfully wait as long. And, and I, it, I had to wait uh, for Carlos to get injured to get my chance, but mm. to, to come in with confidence and to be a part of that setup early on for me was, was, was good. And, and I enjoyed that because I think they, they could see that I was ready for it. And, 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 and so once I got my opportunity, which was about a year and a half, two years into my national team was when the Confederations Cup happened in 2009. We had just, uh, we had just finished the Gold Cup and um, they didn't, they took a select group to, to South Africa because it's the warm up tournament for the World Cup in 2010. But it's always the nine regional champions. So it's all really good teams. And so my mm-hmm. first three starts for the national team, for real, like outside of like El Salvador away in the Gold Cup or like, you know, also, or like some, some friendly era, uh, you know, that was kind of like, my first games but they weren't like games where I was playing with the first team guys every time mm. so mm. the first time I actually got to play against them was uh was Italy Brazil and Egypt in the Confederations Cup so those are the first wow. three games as, as, a, as a real starter with the real first team that I got to mm-hmm. have in South Africa the year before the World Cup and so you know we go on this run Carlos comes back and then he gets moved to left back and so that's why I really love Bob Bradley for sticking with me. He didn't have to do that. You know, he, mm-hmm. he didn't, mm-hmm. he, I wasn't, I wasn't a popular name on the team sheet. I was just a name people knew because I, I played in England, but you know, no one, I, you know, I had to kind of prove myself, but then I did. And, and after those two games, he's Carlos was back and he's like, I'm moving Carlos to the left. And and so then I'm going to keep you and Gooch. Cause I think you and Gooch are working really well together. And so mm-hmm. then we go on and we beat Spain. We snap their 35 game win streak. And then we go on and lose to Brazil. We go two nil up on Brazil in the final and the first American team that's ever going to win a championship. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then we, and then we lose to Brazil three, two Brazil scores three goals in the second half and beats us. But Crazy. again, those, those were the moments that I got to show the world and myself and Bob Bradley that I can play against the best players in the world and we can win. Absolutely. And mm-hmm. so that's good. So that's kind of what started to gain my confidence to know that I deserved to be on the field for my national team. And then mm. we moved into the world cup and I had a crazy eye, eye transplant my, the year moving into the mm. world cup, I, I got an infection in my eye. I lost the mm. surface of my eye. So I have a, a dead person's wow. cornea. It's basically the window of our eye. Wow. And I had, and I had six months to heal. I had a full transplant surgery, healed my eye in th- three months, played with a stitch in my wow. eye for three months, got made the world cup team, got my stitch taken wow. out. And then played in the World Cup because um, Bob Bob knew it was a freak injury and hopefully I wasn't going to sacrifice who I was as a player. And so he took me and uh, sure enough, had a great World Cup. After the World Cup, I was a free agent and came back to the MLS. Uh, you know, I wanted to continue kind of my leadership role as, as, as what I kind of earned captain of my team at Watford. And then Wat- as the Whitecaps were coming into the league in 2011, um, they were looking for, you know, an experienced player. Mm. Uh, that could help kind of lead their club and really be a part of a franchise from the start. And so for me, that was a good uh, leadership opportunity. I took a pay cut to come back here in the prime of my career because money was never, never the driver for me. Money was a bonus of, of, of why you're there. And so I always just wanted to get the most out of my career. And so I came back to the MLS, uh, finished my career uh, with the White Cats, played, played and captained them for four seasons and really, really was a great help. And, and my goal was to always help the game grow in North America. And I, that's mm-hmm. why I didn't come back when I was 35. I came back when I was 31 and mm-hmm. 30. I was like, I was just turned 31. And so, you know, that was kind of my path. And, and, and it was something that really brought me uh, back into the MLS and, and really appreciated my time and, and the different elements I was able to get out of my career because every one of them was different. And, mm-hmm. and now I get to talk about it. Now I get to, you know, come on your podcast and, and people like you or, or run programs for, for young people that I can use this experience to help and, and to mm-hmm. support and, and so that's kind of what I do now. And, and, and Rise mm-hmm. and Shine is, 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 uh, is our support vehicle. You know, that's why we run programs. We run festivals for uh, older people that can donate money for the younger people. And it mm-hmm. creates this whole ecosystem of support and understanding sure. and, and, and creates community opportunities um, that can help the next generation. And that's, that's what I'm into now. We, you know, again, we, we, we pay for a lot of kids that uh, are underprivileged or, or, under, or are deserving but can't afford it mm-hmm. uh, to, come, mm-hmm. to come to the programs and to, uh, and to hopefully start to you know, be around people that can help them and, and support them and, and really, you know, learn to trust themselves. Because again, going mm. back to the beginning of what this is all about, it's, it's this ability to go out and, and take your life by the hands and, and do what you believe you're capable of. And again, there's a support system that helps that happen. There's a support system that helps that, 
that individual believe in something that's greater than them. Uh, and you need a lot of parts. And if you can't create mm. them all yourself, then you need to, then you need to find them from other people. And um, if it's not your parents, then it, maybe it's your friends. And if you're not your friends or your parents, then maybe it's your coach. And if it's not any of those, you know, maybe it's something you don't even know because you've reached out to them because you've put in some effort to understand that maybe they're like you. And so that's where that mentorship and support and, and, and all that kind of thing come in. And, uh, and that's really what Rise and Shine is all about. Mm. I love it, man. Love it. Unbelievable story. I mean, you know, through all the great things you just shared, you know, two things really stand out is, you know, I think your ability to mentally prepare for, you know, uh, high pressure situations and then that ability to be consistent. So for, you know, for me within this podcast, I love, you know, the stories, love your story, other guys and girls I've had on. I like to take, take those stories and bring practical tips. How, you know, you know, you were playing in the 12th league within about a year and a half, about two years, you're playing in the Prem. You know, I'm sure you've had butterflies and you were nervous, but like from a young age, you know, you even said that, you know, you always wanted, you always dreamt of playing in a big stadium, coming from Green Bay, you know, seeing 80,000, you know, seat stadiums, you always wanted to play there. Um, How did you, you know, mentally prepare step by step to get there? So like going into, Going in, for example, going into the Watford game, going into the Watford trial, mm-hmm. you know, any like practically, I mean, you said you had some positive self-talk with yourself and you were, you know, telling mm-hmm. yourself about your strengths, what to focus on, um, you know, and any specifics. Yeah, you know what, and, and you even kind of explained the same thing, but the words I use is dream big, think small. And, and so dream big, think small is this whole idea. Yeah, you can go play in that big stadium, but how are you going to get there? It starts with, with when you step on the training field. And then once you step on the training field, now it's about feedback loops. It's your own feedback. It's your coach's feedback. It's your teammates' feedback. From there, now you start to create the practice. The practice now creates the new skill set or the new mindset. Both are, you know, if you're practicing both, your improvement will come. And so these are all the small increments that are daily on a daily consistency. Mm-hmm. That you talked about consistency, mm-hmm. but that's true. It's, and if you're not, if you're too tired to work on your body, then you then then we're maybe work on your mind. And 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 so I was because of my design route, I was always trying to look at the details of the game and yes. wonder why ask, ask good questions and understand mm-hmm. why you do things. And then from there you practice. And so for me, it was, it was, that was, that was kind of it. Just this detailed comb all the time of what can I work on? What can I control? It's like controlling the controllables of what you can do. You know, I can't control if he picks me, but I can control why he picks me. Mm-hmm. You, you know what I mean? And so if I'm not, mm-hmm winning a, if i'm not the defender for instance like I, I used to like for the beep test of the fitness cut i my goal always in those was to be the fittest defender because if i'm the mm. fittest defender i have the best opportunity to get picked and if i'm the best defender because i know that i i'm a good slide tackler but i'm not a good header but yet every day i'm working on heading after training because even though i don't like it mm-hmm. i'm still gonna be better to, to, to be in that name on the team sheet once you're on the team sheet that's where confidence starts to come and that's not yours so I used to talk about, I do this talk called the tunnel mentality. And the tunnel mentality mm. is basically about when you, when I talk to the kids about playing against Manchester United for the first time. And so I'm walking into this tunnel and I'm standing there and I'm like, it's at Vicarage Road, our, our home stadium, our first premiership season. And I look over to the right and I see like Edwin van der Sar, Ryan Giggs, Wayne Rooney, Ronaldo, um, Paul Scholes, Rio Ferdinand, Nemanja Vidic, uh, Pat- Patrice Evra. And so I'm looking wow. at these guys and I'm like, yeah. you know, again, <laughs> Im- immediately your brain goes, how the hell am I here? These guys are going to crush me. I'm, uh, how am I, you know, that that's the badge I've looked at my whole life. You know, all these things. Now, if I walk out of that tunnel with that mindset, what's going to happen? <laughs> yeah, crush. Yeah. <laughs> they're going to, yeah, they're going to crush me. Yeah. Yeah. So, but, but, if, but if I come out there and I'm like, listen to that crowd, that crowd's here for me. Cause mm. they are. Mm. If I think that they're here for them, then I'm already taking myself out of the equation. But they're here for me, too, because I got picked by my coach to be there mm-hmm. and stand in that line with them. So mm-hmm. first off, take, take, take confidence that I deserve to be here. You know, if you start thinking that Ronaldo's going to smash me because he's so good, like, oh, my God, he is 6'1", 220. Like, oh, my God, yeah. like, he's going to crush me today. You know, yeah. and then I go up against him and I'm like, hey, Ronaldo – and then, he, you know, he's going to crush me, you know, but mm-hmm. if I come in going, oh, he is one of the best players in the world. I now get to go play against the best world player in the world. If I play well, will I now be considered 
one of those. Will I now mm-hmm. be considered something? So take confidence in the fact that I get to go out there, picked by somebody else to challenge his reputation. And so mm-hmm. I always look at reputations and reputations are badges, they're names, they're all these things, right? And so I used to love challenging reputations. Because the world tells us something, mm, I love and that. the world yeah. tells us that there's something else. And every one of those hundred people or hundred thousand people, fifty thousand people are going to think that Ronaldo's better than me. Mm. So what's what? I got nothing to lose. Exactly, exactly. I, I, I have nothing to lose. So if I go out there and kick him and challenge him and give him the hardest day I've seen, because I can, that's what I have the ability to do. Mm. Maybe that'll happen. Maybe he'll go missing that day. Maybe I will disrupt his rhythm. And if not, and he scores a goal and and that's cool too, because that's what they're expecting. But if I'm sitting in the tunnel going, I deserve to be here because somebody else picked me. I get to go out there and try to kick the best player in the world. I get to go and challenge him. And if I do well, and I get to be a better player that people are going to consider. Mm-hmm. Now I can walk out of that 25,000, 50,000 seat stadium mm. with a little bit higher chest, exactly. with a little bit more with a little bit more purpose that I get to be there. I don't have to be there. I get to. And so that's that kind of half choose to get to is in that whole kind of growth mindset concept. Is, mm. is all based around that. And so when I sit in those tunnels, that's what I was thinking about. Because you can psych yourself out really quick. Okay. You can and, and you start thinking about all the people that are watching, you know, let alone the ones in the stadium. You know, you got, you know, the implications of making a mistake in front of, you know, billions of people that watch the Premier League every weekend. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. You, you can get yourself right into a, into, mental, into a mental mess if you start mm. thinking about that. But if you start thinking about the positives of why you're there, what makes you there, what the skill set you're bringing to make you actually be on that field and that you can actually go and kick somebody. And then again, you get that first tackle in, you kick Ronaldo and that crowd goes, Whoa. now you're like, yeah, this is what yeah, I'm yeah. doing. That's, and now and sure. then I get pumped up and I want to do it for another 93 minutes because I had the fitness and I was ready for it. Mm. So again, mm. what makes all of those pieces, you're fit enough, you're good enough, you get picked by somebody else, you're in those stadiums, you, everyone in that stadium wants to be you. So take confidence in that you are you and that you can go out mm. there and do that. You're lucky to be there. You're, you're fortunate to be there. So don't be mm. scared, <laughs> you know, mm-hmm. go and own it. And so that was mm-hmm. kind of where I used to I shift a lot of my mental things. When I started yes. to focus on, Oh my God, I have to play against these players. Oh my God, Ronaldo's going to crush me. It's like, I get to play against that dude. I'm going to keep, I'm going to be relentless until he crushes me. And if not, he's mm. going to look at me and be like, shit, I had a bad, I had a hard day. And so that's the exactly. mindset I, I would, I would walk into. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, just like you said, being able to flip the switch, flip the perspective, and then what's, you know, you talked about in the beginning, you know, taking, you know, small steps into bigger steps, small goals lead to bigger goals, taking that macro and then, you know, shifting, shifting it to, you know, micro, you know, minute by minute. And then once you do those micro things, it adds up to a nice macro game. Mm-hmm. Um, exactly. So yeah, man, I, I, you know. Really unbelievable story. Uh, a couple last questions uh, I got for you. Um, if you could go back to yourself at any age with the knowledge that you have today, uh, what age would you go to and what would you tell yourself? Good question. Um, I'd probably go back to that kind of crossroads of like college where I'm like, mm. you know, should I go to Chicago? Should I stay in my hometown and be like a big fish in a small pound and, mm-hmm. and challenge and challenge myself to things that other people are trying to tell me to play safe on, you know, cause mm-hmm. I had a scholarship offer in green Bay to stay in my hometown and do my thing. And I was like, I don't know, man, I think I want to, I want to try to test myself. And I would come back and be like, this is going to be the greatest thing you could ever do for yourself is, is to take it up, take your life on yourself and, because again, my mom wanted me to stay in town. My friends wanted me to stay in town and then they could come to the games and I could be close to home and all this other stuff. And there was a part of me that just wasn't believing that, you know, and we're all inside of ourselves. Right. And I think we don't, I don't think we trust ourselves enough and our intuition mm, and what we like and yes. who we are. And, and so I would go back to then and say, continue to trust, continue, trust mm, your intuition. And, and, and it, was, it was those reasons that allowed me to be in the situations where I could gain confidence as a player to change positions from a coach that actually saw something in me that I didn't see. And if I yes. would have stayed in my hometown because I thought it was comfortable or was because, because I, because I thought I could be something that I, you know, that I wanted to be in a, in a, in a, in a small place, I never would have made it to the extent that I would have. And, and so I, mm-hmm. I, would, I would go back and, and just, and just to say the same thing, like, trust it, do it. You, you, mm. You're going to, it's going to, it's going to be a good decision for you. And, mm. uh, uh, and I think it's, I just think it's just important because a lot of that times, you know, when you get to those crossroads of your big moments in life, it's like when you leave home and then once you are left home, like what do you do with that experience? I think is it's huge for, for people and what they want to get out of mm. their lives. 
Mm. Yeah, I mean, it, it comes back to what you said in the beginning, you know, the first pillar, you know, belief. And it's, you know, believing in your own, you know, your own intuitions, your own gut. And, you know, I think something that's huge is, you know, you have that, that intuition from yourself, but then you hear the, those external sources, you know, and they want the best for you. You know, they want, you know, they want you to do the thing that, you know, looks the easiest, that's the easiest road because they think it'll be the best and you'll, it'll make you the most successful and the happiest. But sometimes, you know, it's like you said, it's trusting your own gut going outside those comfort zones and then, you know, truly realizing and manifesting yourself, you know, as a, as a player and a person through those, you know, those uh, in, intuitive decisions and, mm-hmm. you know, making the most of it, being able to adapt. hundred percent. And it is kind of like this circle of all of those things. It has to start with that internal piece. And then you're like, okay, I'm going to try this because I think I can. Yeah. And then it's like, now you try it. And then you're like, Hey coach, what did you think about that? Hey player, did, what did you think about that? Hey, you, what did you think about that? Mm-hmm. You'll get answers in three directions and then you'll get to the next step. And then it's like, Oh, mm-hmm. well, I love this part. And then now I'm moving into the next opportunity with the same knowledge and practice that I've just received. Now I'll come into that arena with a little bit more knowledge and a little bit more practice. And if mm-hmm. I know what those are, it's going to get better. Very rarely mm. does it get worse when you, when you have mm. those pieces and when you enter the, and you enter, when you enter the space. And so, yeah, that consciousness of, of understanding is, is huge. And it's not just understanding yourself. You'll, you might even understand that your intuition is off if you practice properly and you understand and you ask the right feedback and you, and you mm. get the right loops of, of understanding. And that's okay too, because you know, we're not, we're not, we're not perfect and we're definitely exactly. not always right. We're definitely exactly. not always right. And, and when we're, and, and, and if we don't take that as this mental mental health shot to the face, oh, well, I got mm. that one wrong. Let's get the next one right. You know, mm. you see how easy that is to switch, but people get in there, oh, I got that wrong. And then they let it affect them. And then they don't mm. get confidence in the next game. And they think that they suck because mm. they had one bad game. And now coach isn't going to play them. Or my teammate thinks I suck. Or my mom doesn't like me anymore. And like, all of a sudden it's like, boom. And now I got to, now I got to yeah. like really train to get out of that. Instead of just going, mm-hmm. oh, well, I think that way. Oh, that's a game where things are going to go right. And now I'm, I'm staying at that level. I don't got to go like this. and I don't have to live mm. my life like this anymore. You know what I mean? Sure. I think a lot of young players, sure. a lot of young players, especially nowadays with the pressure that comes with that, mm. um, I, I think really get into those mental ruts. And, and, and I think mm. it's a little bit too early for them to do that, and, and, or, for, or at least for them to think that way, or at least to, to put themselves in the, into that mental turmoil because they're not at that stage mm. yet. Mm. Yeah, I love it, man. I, I really love it. If we if we can end off just, you know, your top piece of advice for any player looking to sign their first professional contract. I know we've discussed tons of great mm-hmm. things, but if you could give your number one piece of advice, what would it be? Um, I think it's, 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 you know, it's a formula. It's a, it's really a formula to all of it. And, and, and that's yeah. the, the most important one for me is that positivity piece. It's, it's that yes. understanding that this is enjoying, this is enjoyment at the highest level. Even if you don't make it, you have done things that 95% of other people would never do. You know, you got the scholarship to even get yourself in a chance to, you know, to make it as a pro you have had an, ex- if you can, if you're in a, in a conversation at all to be a professional, you've made it way farther than everybody else. Mm-hmm. And really. And, and so I think that, that it, it, what I think is that, that when you transfer to that, if you make it great, do the same thing again at a higher level. Cool. But even if you don't, you're like, mm. I have these intangibles that made me very, very successful in 95% of the rest of the world that didn't even mm. get here. Mm. Now you take those intangibles and you put them into another passion that you either have, or you were about to find. Mm. You can do the same thing and then you'll figure out that that is your purpose or that is your passion. So mm. I, 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 my best advice is for young people, if you make it awesome, keep doing what you're doing and understand why you got there and then mm. do it again at a higher level with an even more finite, finite coin mm-hmm. or, 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 or approach. And if you did it, don't lose confidence in that. Use what you had and use all of the pieces that have gotten you to high successful places in a bunch of different ways you use mm-hmm. that to continue to kick, kick on in another direction and pivot in a place that you could stay positive because, you know, uh, people forget about what sport gives us. It gives us yes. so much. It gives us confidence. It gives us ability to practice. It gives us discipline. It gives us communication. It gives us an mm. ability to, to work with other people. 
those are intangibles for life, no matter where you put yourself. And I think when we get to the point of pro or we get to the point where we can make it or we don't, if we don't, we go back to the depths of hell and we think it's like we failed and our life is over and we got to start it all over again. And that's so not true. It's not mm. true at all. And, and, and it's just, it's just pivoting with the intangibles that you didn't make it, but turning it now into something that you can make it at again. And, and I would suggest always that those are the types of things that I've always learned. And I've, again, I've been mm. at the highest level of many, many years and I've seen a lot of people suffer from that, from that depth, even if you make it, even guys that have made it as a pro. And then all of a sudden after one or two years, they get injured or they get off, they get, they'll get a contract and it's the same position. So I'd say mm. whether you make it or not, there's still going to be things that you should take confidence in because it's your story, mm. it's your vessel, it's your life. And I think when you make the most of, of, of your opportunities and you take life on and again, you're, you believe in it, you work hard, you, you have respect for others and, and you're positive along the way, you're, you're going to end up in a good place. I promise you. And so that's, yeah. that's, uh, that's, that's that. how I like to finish. Yeah. I love that. 100%. I mean, you know, just like you said, you know, you take those things that you learned in sport, uh, and then when you go into the real, you know, the real world, whether you, you do make it as a pro or, you know, cause the, your career is going to end at, at some point and you're going to have to go into a different industry and, and taking those, like you said, those things that you learn that 95% of people, they do not learn, uh, mm -hmm. you'll be able to just, you know, crush your competition in, in the, you know, real job world, the real market. Mm -hmm. So. Hey, man, yeah. thanks so much for coming on. I, I really appreciate you taking the time. Uh, for those who want to get in contact with you, learn about your foundation, where can people find you? Uh, Rise, and, Rise and Shine is, 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 our, is our group. Uh, if you ever if you want to watch the movie, it's on YouTube now uh, for free. Mm -hmm. uh, so Rise and Shine is, is available on YouTube. From there, we have a D6 Merit is all my social media handles from Instagram to Twitter, all that kind of stuff. So you can follow along there. And then the app, hopefully within the next six to eight months is going to be coming out and it's gamified learning mm -hmm. for young adults uh, built awesome. up, built through the eyes of celebrity mentors and, and, and people that have been there and done it in their fields from mm -hmm. science to photography, all the way down to sports. And so we're really starting to take like a masterclass live approach to how we can create a growth mindset within the actionable abilities through technology. So look out for mm -hmm. the Ryan app, uh, you know, EA, EA is our founding partner in the app. Um, so, you know, we got a, a, the biggest video game company in the world that believes in what we're doing. And uh, hopefully we can now show the world and give them a more, uh, you know, specific training plan of how people want to take their lives uh, upon their own and, and, and build a growth mindset and go on and be successful. And that's really what Rise and Shine is moving into. You know, now we're a support system and we're a vehicle of support in a bunch of different ways. Uh, and, and we believe in, in the power of positivity. So, yeah, stay positive out there. And, uh, and, and Rise and Shine is, uh, is here to help. Awesome. Thanks so much, Jay. And I'll put all that stuff down in the description for you guys and girls listening or watching. And uh, let's thank Jay once again. Thank you, man. Awesome. I appreciate it. Appreciate it. My right. pleasure. Have a good one. See you, bro. See you.